Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name's Brittany. In today's video, we're going to talk about chocolate supplies and equipment. I want to start with my recommendations for total beginner, all the way up to intermediate or more advanced chocolate work. So I'll start with the bare minimum supplies that you'll want to have to get started with making chocolates at home and then what more expensive and really helpful pieces of equipment you might want to invest in as you advance. I'll talk about these in order of importance, in my opinion, based upon my own experience of learning how to make chocolates from a beginner all the way up to whatever I am now in my own house. So let's get started. We have a lot to cover. All right, I'm going to break all the supplies down into three categories. The first one is very basic, beginner, the first supplies that you'll need to get in order to get started learning how to make chocolate. The second category is intermediate, where you'll start wanting to learn new techniques to add on to the foundation. And the third one will be advanced supplies that are <laughs> more expensive, but will help you improve efficiency and make things easier for yourself as you're working, but um, they aren't required to get the job done. Um, it's just nice if you can have them and they will make things a lot easier. So jumping into the first category, um, these aren't really in order because you basically need all of them to get going. <laughs> Always food safe gloves, sanitation reasons, but also because chocolate can get fingerprints on it. And when you're handling chocolate, you wanna keep it nice and pretty and clean and gloves definitely help with that. It also is a, a nice little barrier between your warm hands and the chocolate, which, you know, can easily melt. Parchment paper. Parchment paper is just something everyone should have in their kitchen. It is useful for baking, but when it comes to chocolate, uh, it's great for placing chocolates on, um, storing chocolates on. If you have leftover tempered chocolate, you spread it out on the parchment paper, let it set up, then break it up and reuse it. Um, it's great for making parchment paper piping bags, which um, I use so much for chocolate work. Um, so yeah, parchment paper. And the best kind, in my opinion, is the pre-cut rectangles that fit a half sheet tray. Speaking of half sheet trays, half sheet trays, but not just half sheet trays, half sheet trays with their lid. Um, they're just the greatest thing. So these are great for making chocolate decorations on top of, but they're also just great um, laying down a piece of parchment paper, putting on leftover chocolate, popping it in the fridge to set up. Um, it's just great for transportation. You can put finished chocolate bars or bonbons in this, cover it um, with the lid to protect it from humidity and put it in the fridge for storage. Now we all know chocolate has to be tempered and depending on what method you're using, you're going to need a bowl. <laughs> because chocolate has to be melted first before we can temper it. So you have a couple options for bowls. Um, if you're using a microwave to warm up your chocolate, you're going to want a microwave safe plastic bowl or a, poly or a polypropylene bowl. And that's what this one is. It's microwave safe. And the reason you wanna use polypropylene or um, plastic is because it doesn't retain heat. So it, it won't continue heating your chocolate after you pull it out of the microwave. Whereas glass retains heat and it'll hold the heat and it can continue heating up your chocolate after you take it out of the microwave. So it's easy to accidentally get your chocolate too warm. And you know, when you're tempering, you really wanna control the temperature of your chocolate. Your second option for melting your chocolate is to use a stainless steel bowl and a double boiler on the stove. So basically you heat up the water until it's boiling, turn it off and you use the hot steam to melt your chocolate from underneath. So that's another option to begin with. And when you're tempering chocolate in a bowl, whether it be plastic, polypropylene or stainless steel, 
Uh, once you get it tempered, you know that tempered chocolate sets up pretty quickly. Your chocolate will begin to set up around the edges and if you're working for a little while with it, you need to keep it warm and at working temperature. <laughs> and an easy way to do that is with a blow dryer. Yeah, like a hair blow dryer. <laughs> um, we all have one, funny enough actually, as I just say that we all have one, I actually don't have one here because it burned out and I got a heat gun instead. So anyway, um, but most of us already have a blow dryer. So it's the perfect basic or beginner supply to have because you don't have to buy anything. We'll talk about upgrading in the next section, but for now, when you're just learning, you can keep your chocolate warm by gently going over it with a blow dryer. Anyone who's working in a kitchen should already have a nice spatula. I love this one. It's a high heat spatula, so you know you're safe to use it doing whatever. So it's just a good thing to have. Of course, you'll want a couple of these for chocolate work. And you can't work with chocolate without a thermometer. <laughs> and this is the one I started with. Well, I had a couple more before, but when I really got into tempering chocolate, I was using this one. It's an infrared thermometer. I would say it's pretty trustworthy and fairly cheap. I ordered it on Amazon. The thing to know about infrared thermometers is that they measure the surface temperature. So when you're tempering your chocolate, you gotta make sure to stir it so that all the chocolate is um, the same temperature before you measure. That's the only drawback. Otherwise, it works great. And we'll talk about upgrading to a more expensive option in the next section. Now, a lot of times people are having trouble with tempering and don't know why. Even if you're hitting all your temperatures perfectly, you might just be like, what is going on? And it might be because your room temperature is too high or the humidity is too high. So right out the gate, I recommend that you buy a little thermometer that measures your room temperature and your humidity. And you want your room temperature right now, my apartment's heating up a little bit <laughs> um, and these lights aren't helping, but it's 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Really, my, I really like working at like 70 or 69 degrees Fahrenheit. It keeps things cool and I get super hot. <laughs> so, um, so your room temperature should be between 69 to 71, 72 at the most degrees Fahrenheit for working with chocolate or you might run into problems. And the humidity in here right now is 45%, which is pretty high. Um, usually here in Utah, we're pretty dry. Um, it can get down to 30%, but in the summer, it's a little hotter, a little bit more humid but you want to, if possible, keep your room below 50% humidity for working with chocolate because it can, um, the humidity can cause dullness on your perfectly shiny chocolate, which is really sad. And after you have the most basic supplies like a bowl, spatula, and thermometer, you're ready to temper. So you'll need some nice couverture chocolate. Um, the chocolate that I always use is Calibut. This is the Calibut dark chocolate, Calibut milk chocolate, some white chocolate. It's all Calibut. Um, caramel chocolate, so good, underrated. I feel like, where was that my whole life? I just started using it this year, it's so good. And ruby chocolate. Um, you can use whatever brand is convenient for you to buy in your location, obviously. Um, just make sure it's couverture. And really, it's just about preference. Once you get practice working with it, what brand you like. Um, there's different fluidities and all sorts of things, but I find that these ones work great for me for making chocolates. Now, when I first started making chocolates, you know, in culinary school, I learned how to temper with couverture chocolate and then I came home and, you know, things weren't working quite right. I did it a couple times, it worked, and then it wouldn't work, didn't know why. So then I jumped between couverture chocolate and compound chocolate and it worked for a while, but I feel like me using compound chocolate for a couple of years was just a crutch and I was actually holding myself back. So my recommendation to you guys is that if you're struggling with tempering couverture chocolate to just keep practicing because it's worth it in the end. Once you get it down and master tempering, couverture chocolate is actually so much easier to work with and it's the highest quality and it tastes better. So anyway, if your first hurdle is tempering chocolate, 
Just keep practicing until you master it. And then everything after that will be so much easier to learn, I promise. And just another little piece of advice while we're talking about that. Um, if you're struggling with tempering chocolate, don't get ahead of yourself and try to start molding bonbons or making elaborate chocolates. Just keep practicing tempering before moving on to the next thing. Maybe the first step would be to start molding chocolate bars because they're just solid and you've got to have a nice tempered chocolate to do that. And then really once you get that down, move on to molded bonbons with fillings. And once your tempering's down, you're going to need some good molds. And I recommend the polycarbonate molds. And if you're going to start with one or two molds, you know, you can get excited and start buying all sorts of different shapes and ones with different patterns. But honestly, when you're first learning, really stick to the basics, classic shape that you can have um, success with. The good old half sphere is the way to go. They look great, they're uniform. Um, some of the other shapes are really actually, <laughs> they can get stuck in the mold. It's hard to get even shells. There's all sorts of things, but I would just say start with a basic half sphere or really smooth shapes. Um, they're really easy to learn with. And before I was talking about using compound chocolate as a crutch, the other thing I was using as a crutch was these plastic molds. And part of it was because it was what was available to me near my house where I live. Um, nobody sold polycarbonate molds in person, so you had to find a good source online. So I just bought the plastic ones because they were easy. But once again, my advice to you would just be skip over the plastic molds. They're flimsy, they flop, they're hard to use, <laughs> and the results aren't that good either. They're, the one benefit is that they're easy to get the chocolates out because if they get stuck, you can like push on the top and pop them out. But they're just not that great. They always have like a little, where you scrape the bottom, they always have like a little lip of chocolate. Like they're just not that clean. I would say just, just go straight to the polycarbonate molds and get your tempering down and you'll, you'll be good to go. And in case you don't know what I'm talking about, here's an example. <laughs> As you can see, like picture, well, you can see in my first how to mold chocolates video that I show with both these and polycarbonate. And you can see, even though I've had a lot of practice, they're still kind of difficult because, you know, they bend while you're working with them, but this is what they look like. Yeah, I would just jump right to polycarbonate if you can. Next up, these aren't required, but I find them really useful for cleaning off my chocolate scrapers and just spreading out chocolate, things like that mini metal offset spatulas. I have like 20 of these. They just, I use them so much. They're just great. And then along with these, you're going to need some chocolate scrapers. And I have these, I have two of these ones from Chocolate World, but they're actually not my favorite. My favorite one is this one I bought like 10 years ago from Home Depot. It's a spackle. Um, what is this? It's a home, a home thing, a home scraper thing, <laughs> something for walls or something, putty, a putty, putty scraper or something. Anyway, it never, it's never rusted. It's a lot thicker than this one. And this one I feel as I scrape, it has bent the edges a little bit, so then I have to bend them back. And when you're scraping your mold in order to do it clean on the first swipe, you want a really solid, straight scraper. And I just feel like these ones are great. Plus they're really wide, so you never have to worry about like going off the edge. I just really love this one, it's my favorite. And then kind of along the same lines, just like classic bench scraper. I always use this for cleaning off all the leftover chocolate on the counter. Of course you can use one of these, but this one's really thick and sturdy and it's really great for scraping. Now, once you get more into fillings, like if you're making a filled bonbon with caramel or ganache or something, it's really great to have some disposable piping bags. Um, 12 inch are great if you're doing like one tray of chocolates, like uh, one mold full. But if you're doing a couple molds full or more, um, the 16 inch is really great. It's kind of 
kind of my go-to size. Um, and then along with the disposable piping bags, <laughs> I used to like be kind of stubborn, like I don't need a bag clip or like to tie it off. But I found in the last year, I started using these bag clips and it really is great because <laughs> you don't have to constantly hold the bag. So I'm glad I bought these because it, it's so simple, but it makes such a difference. So um, also most of the time, you know, you need to cool down your filling before you can put it in, fill up the shells. Um, it's great to clip the bag, the bag full of filling closed, and then um, roll it on your cool countertop and that will help it cool down. So these are just great to have, highly recommend. They're so cheap, why not get them? a basic kitchen scale, um, pretty straightforward <laughs> um, for measuring the weight of ingredients and chocolate. And just a couple things for cleaning your polycarbonate chocolate molds. Um, some microfiber cloths. The reason why is because they're really soft and if you're going to use a soap and hot water and rub off the chocolate and um, all the extra cocoa butter fats, um, you want something that won't scratch your mold. So that's this. Or if you just want to clean with your hand and water, you can also do that. But for shining up your molds after they're dry, you can use a clean microfiber towel or some cotton balls, or you can use cotton pads too. Now, depending on what you're interested in doing with chocolate, um, you might not want to use acetate sheets, but if you're interested in when you're first learning and practicing tempering to spread out chocolate and have it be shiny on the other side. So if you're making swirls or curls or flat shapes with chocolate for garnishes, acetate sheets are great. Um, chocolate will be shiny if the surface that you're putting it on is shiny. So acetate sheets are great for making tempered chocolate decorations, or if you've been around here for a while, you know I love making chocolate boxes. So this is what I use to make them shiny. And the last thing when you're first getting started is you'll probably just be making natural colored chocolates, like dark chocolate bonbons, white chocolate. So um, the outside shell will be just the natural color of the chocolate. And there are a couple really simple ways you can spice that up. And my favorite way is to use edible metallic luster dusts. So maybe you'll want some gold luster dust. You can put gold splatters on the outside of the chocolate shell, or you can paint other decorations on it. Another thing I like to use that's really simple is edible silver and gold leaf. Once again, like after you take the chocolate out of the mold, you can jazz them up a little bit by adding some of these edible leaves. And I apply both of these, the luster dust and the leafing with lemon extract. You can also use vodka. You just need to use something high in alcohol content. And once you've mastered your chocolate tempering and molding bonbons and chocolate bars, and you know that this is something that you wanna stick with and that you really love, I recommend investing in a couple more expensive pieces of equipment to make things easier and more efficient for you. And maybe you even want to start making larger quantities of chocolates and giving them away as gifts for family and friends, or maybe even selling some. So the first handful of items I'm going to talk about are the first things I would buy. As soon as you know you love chocolate and you want to stick with it, I would buy a heat gun. They're not that expensive, under $100. Um, I can't remember how much this one was, but I'll link it down below, it wasn't that bad. Um, <laughs> replace your blow dryer with a heat gun. You'll use this all the time. Once you have it, you'll use it all the time. Um, so, heat gun. You will also want a stick blender. Um, this is necessary for a lot of chocolate fillings, but even besides that, um, it's great when you're tempering chocolate because you know how sometimes if you're seeding chocolate, <laughs> you overestimate or underestimate the amount of chocolate and then the seeds aren't melting as fast and then it's cooling down. And anyway, the stick blender can really help break those pieces up to make a smoother chocolate and help everything get melted together and blend. I should have maybe put this one first because if you're struggling with tempering, it might be a thermometer problem. I mentioned I started with the infrared thermometer, which is true, and many chocolatiers use infrared thermometers, but you might wanna have one of both kinds. Um, 
So an infrared and then a regular one. What would you call the regular kind? <laughs> I don't know. But this one is a Thermapen one. And um, the reason I put it in the second section is because it is expensive. It was over $100. I think it was $120, but I feel like it's a really trustworthy brand and I love it so far. But what's great about it is if I'm ever like questioning anything, if you have two thermometers, you can um, use both of them to kind of like check each other. I do that sometimes, but actually most of the time now <laughs> I'll check my um, infrared thermometer with this one because I tend to trust this one more. So I highly recommend this brand and it comes in cute colors. And once you're getting into doing a lot of molded bonbons with fillings, especially if you're making caramel or anything where you're um, cooking sugar, you're going to need a really nice stainless steel pot with a thick base. It helps um, distribute heat evenly and cook things um, evenly. <laughs> and so anyway, it's just something to invest in. Now, next up is my first equipment um, recommendation that's above $500. And that is a chocolate warming tank. This is the one I have. Um, it's just great because first of all, you can melt your chocolate without watching it. You just put all your chocolate in it, turn it to the top temperature for your tempering and give it a couple hours while you're working on other things like decorating your molds. And then you come back to it, temper your chocolate. With the warming tank, I always use the seeding method. And then once it's tempered, you, so you can take the tank out. So you temper it and then you put it back in the warmer, which is now set to your working temperature. And it holds your chocolate and keeps it warm while you're working, which is so nice <laughs> because if you've experienced tempering in the stainless steel or plastic bowl, and then constantly like trying to keep it warm with your heat gun or your blow dryer, you'll know how annoying it is. And it's fine to start. That's what you have to do when you're learning. But as soon as you can, I would invest in a warming tank. They are really great. And I haven't yet invested in a second warming tank because I haven't needed to. You can eventually do that so that you could just always be having like white milk, dark chocolate, warm, tempered, ready to go. Or what you can do is just buy a couple more of these. Um, because it comes with a lid, you can leave your chocolate inside. And if you're switching between chocolates, you can just take this one out. This is my milk chocolate. Take this one out, put in the one with your white chocolate or other kind. So if you don't want to buy like three warming tanks, you can just buy three of the bins that go inside. Next thing is more of a fun thing. Um, I recommended in the previous section to stick with more simple molds that are um, easy to work with and kind of classic. Uh, because these molds are expensive. They're like 20 to $30, sometimes $40 each. So you want to make sure you're putting your money in something that's useful. And I've wasted a lot of money on molds. Okay. For example, this lip one looks cute for Valentine's day, right? It is just not the greatest mold. Be you want to why? Because, um, it's hard to work with. If you do, if you shell your chocolate like normal, tap, 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 there is this edge where the, in between the lips, it comes up in a line and that spot is always thin because it's raised. So it doesn't get as thick of a shell as the rest of the mold. And when you pop them out, they break either that, or you can see through to the filling, which isn't like, it just, it doesn't work like it should. So be really picky with your molds, but also have fun. So like for um, bars, you know, you can get really cute, cute bar molds. You can get, you can get fun ones that also work well. And you'll start to see which ones are going to work nicely and which ones aren't. Um, if there's a lot of corners, that's usually kind of difficult because bubbles get trapped in there and you can't get the chocolate in the corners or the corners will cause your chocolate 
bar or bonbon to get stuck and they're hard to unmold. Um, but anything with like a smooth surface, are, they work really well and you can also have fun with. Um, here's another one that's nice. See how, like there are corners, but because of the large surface area that's smooth, it's really easy to work with. A lot of nice surface area for decoration. So that's also nice. You can buy little snack bars, kind of more the shape of a, a long candy bar. And you can see these are all, it's nice and smooth. Chocolate comes out really easy. They're really shiny because there's a lot of shiny surface area. These are just some plain kind of rectangle. So anyway, you can still have fun. So once you get more into chocolate making, you can start to have more fun with your molds, but also my big, best advice is just to be picky. Um, and you'll get the hang of it as you practice working with chocolate, like which ones are going to work well and which ones probably aren't. And just don't get too overexcited <laughs> because I kind of did that in the beginning when really I think I should have focused on just sticking to like a very normal classic mold like the half sphere and just like mastering it because then that makes everything else easier. Again, once you've mastered tempering, another thing that's fun to play around with is um, cocoa butter transfer sheets and you can buy them in all different patterns and decorations. You can even order custom ones with your name or other things on it. I just have like a bunch of Valentine's ones. <laughs> So like these are little lips, really cute on white chocolate. And with transfer sheets, you can use them to make um, patterned decorations for garnishes, or you can cap your chocolates with them. So you can use a transfer sheet on the bottom of the mold and the bottom of the chocolate will have a cute pattern to it. The reason I put transfer sheets in the intermediate section is because you really have to have your tempering down because you have to use these at a certain temperature and kind of know how they work before you use them. And they're also, they can be kind of expensive. So I would say it's a little bit more intermediate to start playing with those, but they're pretty fun when you get to it. Next thing is cocoa butter. And once you get to the cocoa butter stage, chocolate making gets even more fun because you can start taking your cocoa butter tempered and adding colors um, to your cocoa butter and making colored bonbons, which is so fun. It's what I always wanted to learn how to do and I finally learned how to do it. Um, but yeah, this is a really fun stage to get to. And after you learn these techniques, the creativity, the things that you can come up with are basically endless. Um, so you can buy plain cocoa butter and color it yourself or you can buy pre-colored cocoa butter. I've been using Chef Rubber pre-colored cocoa butter a lot. It's just really easy to work with. It's already colored. And if I want to alter the color, I just add white or you can mix colors together. Yeah, so colored cocoa butters, um, they're just so fun. Like you can just, this is when you can really, really get creative. And once you start getting into colored cocoa butters, you're going to need something to apply those to the mold. So what I'd start with is a bunch of good paint brushes. And you've seen me use this one a lot. Um, my large, soft, round brush. I use this one for the background a lot. And I'll link all my favorites down below. This one is like a really fine paintbrush you can add decorations with, and then just a bunch of sizes in between. You can add colors to your chocolates with. And then along with your paintbrushes, you can start to get creative with other things like sponges. I have this whole little bin full of different shapes and sizes. Um, art sponges like this that you can apply cocoa butters with. This is a technique you can apply after the bonbons out of the mold. Stamps, you can use luster dust or cocoa butter. Some vinyl tape to do like stripes and things like that into your mold. You can even just use your finger with a food safe glove. You can use Q-tips. Basically, you can just start to get creative to use anything you can come up with that's sanitary to put cocoa butter into your mold. 
And once you get into cocoa butters, I highly recommend you just invest in a bulk pack of these restaurant containers, these plastic restaurant containers. They're microwavable safe. Um, this is what I put my cocoa butter into, temper it. When I'm done, I just simply put the lid on and store it until next time. So they're just super convenient and they're great to work with. I'll just show you a couple real quick. So yeah, these are just two different colors of pink and I print my own label from the original color just so I don't forget what it's called in case I need to reorder it. And then I just store my cocoa butters here. And then for cocoa butters, I buy smaller quantities of. I use these um, smaller plastic containers and I'll link these down below as well. So like usually for like glitter colors that I don't use as often, um, I just use the smaller container to store them in. And then along with the containers when working with cocoa butter, a couple other things I love to use are the straight metal spatulas, mini spatulas. Um, I use these to stir. They're super easy to clean. So when you're, after you're using cocoa butter to clean whatever utensils before you put it in the sink or the cocoa butter just gets stuck everywhere, use your heat gun and a paper towel and just wipe it off. And these are so easy to clean and they're great for stirring just cause they're straight. So I highly recommend buying like 20 of those. <laughs> Or you can use mini spatulas to stir your cocoa butters, which I also do sometimes. Um, just, I have like just different variety of these. These ones are cute and really nice because they're also high heat spatulas. All right, now we're getting into a couple other fun things um, that are, can be kind of expensive, but if you're, if you're really getting into it and you're having a problem with your humidity percentage in your kitchen, you can actually buy a dehumidifier. And this thing, I'm pretty impressed by it. Um, I'll link it below. I bought it off of Amazon. I think it was $90 or something. It works really great. So when I'm making chocolates, like for a couple days in a row, I will just have this plugged in all the time, turn it on, and you'd be surprised at how much water it pulls from the air. I should have done it to show you guys, but after like a day or like overnight, it'll be like this full with water and it can decrease the humidity in my kitchen by like five to 10%, which is a good amount. So, you know, if you struggle with humidity, I would recommend this. I've noticed that um, if I'm doing a lot of chocolates and then I'm cleaning the molds with hot water or doing other dishes, the humidity level rises by like five to 10%. So this kind of helps me keep my room even when I'm in here working a lot. The next thing is kind of optional. It's not required ever, <laughs> unless you're doing the tabling method for tempering, um, but a large marble slab. When I temper chocolate, I usually use the seeding method. I think it's the easiest, cleanest, most reliable method for me. And so I don't ever use my marble slab really for tempering. But what I do use it for is tempering cocoa butters and also cooling down and tempering my chocolate bonbon fillings. The marble slab does a really great job of keeping uh, a cool temperature. And so it's usually a lot cooler than my countertop. So I will set the cocoa butter containers on it um, as they're cooling down to 27 degrees Celsius. Um, I also use it for cooling down like chocolate decorations or yeah, cooling down my fillings. So it's not necessary, but it can be helpful depending on, depending on what you're doing. If you do a lot of decorations and things like that with chocolate, then you might want one because it can be really helpful. And then just two more little small things, not very expensive. Um, once you're ramping up your production, if you're starting to like take chocolates to friends or sell them or deliver them anywhere, um, especially if it's warm outside, you know, you need to keep your chocolates at a certain temperature. Cool. <laughs> um, I found what works great if you're not up to the point of buying like a really expensive cooler, although that's a good thing to have too. I bought this like flimsy food transportation box cooler that's easy to store and it gets the job done. Um, it's like this. And if you have like boxes of chocolates, it's really kind of easy to stack them like this and it maintains its shape. Um, and then inside this, you just use 
some of these um, ice packs, frozen, of course. Um, and what I do is I put them in like Ziploc bags, seal them up just in case there's a leak or anything. Um, also there's, you know, they get frosty and you don't want any moisture getting into your chocolate. So I wrap them or I put them in a baggie first and then I always wrap them with towels and I always put um, towel, like just kitchen towel layers between the ice and the chocolate. And then, and then just out of curiosity, like I know the ice pack will keep it cool enough, but I just get curious to like what the temperature is. So I usually throw one of these in there too, just to like keep an eye on things. And that works really well for delivering chocolates. All right, moving on to the more advanced equipment and supplies, in my opinion. Um, this is where you might find more expensive things <laughs> to purchase. But to me, I've labeled these advanced because they're not necessary. Like I made chocolates for years without any of these things. Even the chocolate warmer from the previous section. You can do a lot with very minimal equipment. So you don't need to feel like you have to get these things, but they do make things easier. So we'll start with the first thing on my list is a wine cooler. And the reason you want a wine cooler maybe is because chocolate really, um, you know, room temperature isn't cool enough for chocolate, but your standard fridge is too cold technically for chocolate to be stored. And your regular fridge is also full of humidity and condensation and moisture. And that isn't great for chocolate either. And a wine cooler is more controlled and there aren't other things sitting in there, adding moisture to the air and things like that. And also like food smells and things like that, <laughs> you know, things that can affect your chocolate negatively. Um, it's kind of nice to have a little separate thing where you can store your chocolates and you can trust it to be at the right temperature, um, the right humidity, and um, your chocolates will be protected. And I started using the wine cooler at the beginning of this year and I love it so much because it, I will recommend the exact one to you if you want one because I love it. It has pull out wooden, like not drawers, but shelves, <laughs> wooden pull out shelves that fit two trays of chocolates perfectly. And yeah, just this little wine cooler um, is like a mini chocolate fridge, which is what you would use if you had, you know, a chocolate shop. Um, so this is the great like transition between like higher production in a home and like full blown having a chocolate shop. So yeah, it's great. Um, mine has a top, a top section and a bottom and you can choose different temperatures. So what I do is I put one at one temperature for storing finished chocolates and then one at another one for when I do the shells and fillings and stuff. And it's been working out really good for me. And so along with the wine cooler, these are just great. I recommend purchasing um, some quarter sheet trays, these mini ones. They're so cute. And um, they fit like about two polycarbonate molds worth of chocolates or just a little bit less in here. And I always line them with the pre-cut mini quarter sheet parchment uh, paper sheets. I just, <laughs> I think it's so cute for some reason. And then in the wine cooler, I don't use the lid, but when I transport chocolates, I use the lid for protection and also for stacking. They're so convenient. So you just put all your chocolates in, you stack them, and then you can stack multiple um, little sheet trays of chocolates and you can load these up into the carry bag or a cooler with the ice and it just is a great way to move chocolates around. And um, so these sheet trays fit inside um, the wine cooler perfect and you can do one sideways and then one this way stacked on top. So you can really store a lot of chocolates in that little wine cooler, which is why I think it's a great little investment to get started if you're trying to start making a lot of chocolates. And now probably the reason you're investing in a wine cooler is because 
your goal is to start making a lot more chocolates rather than just like one mold at a time. So my next recommendation is that you pick your favorite mold. Now you've had a lot of experience working with chocolates, making bonbons, and you probably have a favorite mold. My favorite mold is this one. It's a um, half sphere mold. And so then my recommendation is that you invest in multiples of that one mold. Because if you're starting to make like chocolate boxes to sell, it's nice when all the chocolates are the same shape with just different colors or patterns or, you know, designs. So you don't wanna have to do one mold at a time, wait, go through the whole process, unmold them, start over. Um, so I recommend getting at least four. So I did a whole wedding with just four molds um, and I made like 300 chocolates, I think, 300 bonbons. Four was okay, but it was a little bit, it was kind of challenging because there were times when I'm like, oh, I have to wait, I have to do that and then that before I can start over with this other flavor. So depending on like the scale you're trying to get to, I would say you wanna have like four to 10 of the exact same mold. And you can invest in them slowly. Like I said, they can be expensive, so, but yeah. Get a bunch of your favorite mold, the one that you love working with the most. And once you start getting more molds, I highly recommend getting some of these stands to organize them in your pantry or on a shelf. Okay, so the next piece of equipment is my last recommendation because I think it's pretty advanced and I know that when people start learning um, cocoa butters and different techniques, they wanna jump right to the airbrush or spray gun. But it can also be very intimidating because if you're not familiar with those pieces of equipment, you're like, where do I start? That's how I felt at least. I was like, I don't know how to buy a compressor. I don't know how to hook up an air gun and they're expensive. And what brand do I buy? And how do I use it? And what are the settings? And I'll be making a video, a couple of videos on that soon. But I think these are pretty advanced techniques um, because you have to buy the right equipment and they're expensive and you don't want to make a mistake on what you choose because it's a lot of money. Second, it's actually pretty challenging to get the cocoa butter tempered correctly, keep it at the right temperature, put it in the airbrush, get the settings correct, spray a nice even coat, keep everything in temper, and then also know like what techniques to use, what patterns, what design you're going for. I think it's pretty, pretty advanced and it's also not great for you to breathe in cocoa butter. So you also need to be aware of that and you need to get a face mask. Um, and then you also need some sort of filtration system. So you can start with your microwave. <laughs> this is what I've been using. You can start with your microwave fan and it pulls thing, you know, it pulls, it's for like using the stove and it's pulling up smoke into the micro, you know, whatever that fan system is. So um, you can use that. I've been using that. And then I just like cut, a, plastic bag, I'll show you all of this, I'll film it. Um, I like cut a plastic bag open and then I like tape it up on the wall so I'm not like spraying cocoa butter and like staining the backsplash and all that. Um, so that's like where you can start when you're airbrushing. Or you can buy an air filtration system I just bought one. It's sitting on my floor right here in a box. I will unbox it for you in my next video. Um, it was around $600. So, um, but I'll link it down below and stick around if you wanna see me test it out for the first time. I'll have a video on that coming soon. Um, but yeah, I just feel like the airbrush spray gun techniques can be pretty intimidating and so, it's my last recommendation because I think you can get a lot done with just a paintbrush and other little tools and your cocoa butters and you can make really cool things and you don't need to jump right to the spray gun. Um, once you've mastered everything else and you want to start 
playing with spray gun and airbrush, I think then go for it. Um, but do a lot of research and, you know, make sure you save up the money to buy the things and yeah. So with that being said, I'm going to tell you some of the things I've learned about compressors, spray guns, and airbrush. I will show you my spray gun. I just ordered an airbrush yesterday, so it hasn't come, but I will link everything that I have or will have down below for you guys. Okay, so this is my spray gun. So far it's worked great. I've only decorated bonbons with it a couple times because I just, it's just a lot of work. I also feel like it's way more wasteful and cocoa butter's expensive. <laughs> um, it's way more wasteful than just using brushes in my opinion, which is another reason why I just like, if you're just doing like a couple molds at a time, I enjoy the process of painting the molds by hand. And like, if you're not into large mass production, I just don't see why you need this, you know? But anyway, this is my spray gun and it's hooked up to my compressor over here. My compressor is really pretty quiet. So my compressor is one gallon, 135 PSI and 0.5 HP. And what I have found in using the spray gun with my compressor is that um, I can only spray for like five seconds and then it'll run out of air. <laughs> and what I learned is the 0.5 HP is how fast it can refill the tank. So you really want like a higher HP, like two to five, um, which is hard to find for like a smaller compressor. And then the tank size is only one gallon, which apparently is a little too small. So a couple other things that I've learned recently is that spray guns use a lot more air than airbrush, airbrushes. So if I were to recommend to you guys what to start with, it would be an airbrush. But the thing is I haven't got mine yet, <laughs> but the person I talked to um, at Grex, which is the brand of air airbrush I bought, he said that um, the tank I currently have will work great with the airbrush. And then what I plan to do is buy a bigger compressor that is five gallons and I think two HP. Um, and it'll be able to keep up with my mini spray gun a lot better. So that's my current plan. Um, and then just another thing you need to be aware of if you're planning to buy an airbrush spray gun compressor system is that you need a moisture filter because you know chocolate and cocoa butter are very sensitive to moisture and so you don't want any of that getting into um, your spray gun or airbrush as you're spraying because that could take things out of temper. So that's just another thing and I'll show you the one that I have and link it down below as well. So then basically you hook the spray gun or airbrush to your hose and then between the hose and the compressor is where I put my moisture filter like this. And so this is the setup I have. Okay, so then the two final things. Um, if you plan to learn how to airbrush or spray gun your molds, you have to have a mask um, to protect yourself from the cocoa butter in the air. And this is really embarrassing to admit, but the first time I used this, I bought this off of Amazon, okay? It's a good brand, 3M. It's a filter mask. I put it on and I just thought I was good to go. And this is why if your interest is in chocolate and not in some of these other things, this can be intimidating and also you can make silly mistakes like me. You need to buy a separate thing to put on to actually filter. Yeah, so I was probably breathing in a bunch of cocoa butter without knowing it, thinking the mask was doing its job. And it wasn't because the user, because the user didn't know what she was doing. So what you need is some of these <laughs> and I'll show you because I want you guys to be safe. <laughs> you gotta wear your PPE. Yeah, so what you're going to do is to just take your filter. It can be kind of tricky. You have to line up the notches and, um, oops, I had it. You snap it in and then 
twist them. So now when you put it on, these are what filters the cocoa butter, okay? So that's very important. Like don't go without that. This part's cheap. It's the compressor and the air gun and spray gun that are expensive and the filtration system. So to start, you'd probably be good with your microwave fan. It'll work. But um, if it's getting, if it's becoming a faff, it's becoming a nuisance, you will want to probably invest in the filtration system um, because it really gets old and messy trying to tape up the bags or using plastic wrap or whatever you want to use. And it also really gunks up your microwave filters. So I just invested in a spray booth. Um, I haven't opened it yet or tested it out. Um, I'm going to do an unboxing and I'm going to try it out in a, a different video coming soon. But uh, mine is from CakeSafe and it's the master spray booth, professional size. It was $670. I actually have a discount code for you with cake safe and that discount code is Brittany K and that gets you guys 10% off which is significant if you're buying something large like the spray booth um, but that is valid one time per customer so yeah if you're going to use it I would use it on something big like this and I know I haven't tested this out yet but I love cake safe I love their brand I have their cake transportation box <laughs> you guys saw it maybe you guys maybe saw that in a different video I used that and it is so nice and I have their acrylic discs for frosting cakes and they're just a good brand they're super nice they have great customer service and so I trust that their spray booth is going to be awesome even though I haven't tested it out yet but um, the reason I went with that well two reasons I really like their brand and also um, if you search for spray booths anywhere else you might find like up to $2,000, which is a lot. <laughs> so I, I'm hoping this is a great lower price option, but does a great job and I think it will. So I'm excited about it. But, but anyway, I think this video got away from me. I've been rambling, but hopefully it's helpful. Um, I would have loved a video like this when I was learning chocolate because it's really nice to kind of have an outline of where to start and what things you would need next on how to advance and kind of like a progress map, you know? So hopefully you guys liked it. But to summarize everything up for you guys, hopefully this helps. Um, besides all the main basic equipment you'll need for chocolate work, like bowls and spatulas and those things, I'm going to summarize my main pieces of equipment in order that I recommend investing in. First, a thermometer. You need a good thermometer for chocolate work. Second is the stick blender. You gotta have it. You gotta have it for fillings and it's also helpful for tempering. Third, a heat gun. Once you have it, you'll wonder how you ever did things without it. Four, a warming tank. Just go for it as soon as you can. <laughs> it, is, it is so, so nice to have one. Five, multiples of your favorite mold. This also saves you so much time and makes you so much more efficient. Six, a wine cooler. This can store so many chocolates and keep them safe and keep them at the correct temperature for you so that you know all your hard work is not wasted. Seven would be the airbrush or spray gun and a compressor, um, totally not required. But once you master all the skills before this, this is something great that you can also have fun with and be creative. And then number eight would be the filtration system. I put this last because you can get by without it by using your microwave. So yeah, the, that's my summary of the larger pieces of equipment that I recommend investing in in order. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed today's video and that you learned something new. If you liked it and found it helpful, please let me know by giving it a like and leaving me a comment down below if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet. Today's the day. If you'd like to see more videos all about chocolate, just click on one of these thumbnails. Thanks so much for watching today and I'll see you soon. Bye.